Hi guys, welcome back to Quran Logics, where I take a very quick look at the logics used and applied in the Islamic Quran. Now, as we know by now, the Quran commands followers to behave in a certain way and to follow what their God deems to be righteous, where there is no definition of what righteous actually is and what it consists of. What we read is about slave keeping, wife beating, extortion and brutal punishments, all things we humans in the 21st century no longer consider to be righteous. And to be fair, the Quran also mentions things like not killing, not lying, not deceiving and propagates honouring parents and supporting those in need. All things where I don't really need a Quran, just my own sense of decency. And it's a pity not all Muslims can do as told. The main problem in my eyes is that the Quran is just a thin booklet with just over, what, 6,000 sentences using vague and ambiguous language requiring extensive enhancements, where the majority of followers turn to the Sunnah, a collection of texts based on the most important human in Islam, Muhammad, a person called a messenger or prophet. This Muhammad is barely mentioned in the Quran and there is nothing about the person in the entire book. Yet, this person is so important that Muslims, those who submit to the Islamic God and Muhammad, must place the man ahead of family and friends, even adding a ritualistic PBUH after the name. Peace be upon him even though he's been dead for over a thousand years, according to the traditional narrative, that is. Why do Muslims do that? Well, because they want to entice their God to put Muhammad into paradise, keep him out of hell. Because in Islam, you can be sure that if you do everything as commanded, you will get to receive the ultimate reward, a place in paradise. Except that you don't. Because... Not even Muhammad can be sure of going to paradise, even though he was handpicked by his God to spread Islam in any which way. Uh, peace be upon uh, him, may God be pleased with him. The Prophet, peace be upon him. Does that mean that in Islamic history they went to people uh, with a sword and said, convert, otherwise we'll kill you? Yes. No, that didn't happen because... As far as spreading Islam, through military conquest, yeah, that's an undeniable part of uh, Muslim history. And, and that's something that is justifiable uh, in, in any kind of argument that we want to present. I, I really... You want me to explain why it's okay, to, why it's not okay to have sex with a nine-year-old? Like in a much... particular social context, in a particular uh, historical milieu. I mean, to me that is... Yes, it can be more, something that is moral and it is acceptable. And even though Muhammad, according to Islamic texts deemed authentic by Islamic scholars, plundered, tortured, enslaved, raped, beheaded and killed, he is still considered to be the most righteous person on the planet. The one with the highest moral standard and to be taken as a mercy and role model for every single human being in all times. Well, except for women, I guess, and, and, and slaves, and sex slaves. But still, Muslims are required to add this PBUH to his name, ignoring that the pen has already written everything, and the Islamic God already knows in advance what will happen. And so, a couple of life forms on some remote speck of dirt somewhere in the universe telling their God what to do is illogical and pretty useless, I guess. And at the end of the day, even his own God needs to pray for him. So, come on guys, these are fairy tales, nothing more. Is any of this logical and befitting an all-knowing, perfect creator God? Why would anyone trust this God? Except the facts, not the fakes.